other device. So, oh my gosh, we're live, everyone. Have you ever noticed that your sleep changed after starting keto? Have you ever noticed how you're hungrier after a night of inadequate sleep? How important is sleep for weight loss? Those questions and so many more we're going to answer today. This episode is for you. So stick around and learn about how a ketogenic diet impacts sleep and over overlaps. Uh, this is live, everyone, so I don't have to do it perfectly. So uh, <laughs> how the ketogenic diet impacts sleep and the overlaps of sleep, obesity, and satiety, and so much more. My very special guest co-host today, Amber O'Hearn, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to Keto Chat Live. I am your host, Carol Freeman. I have a master's in nutrition and clinical health psychology. I'm a board-certified keto nutrition specialist, and I specialize in helping women 40-plus follow a keto diet for sustainable weight loss. And the thing that the lawyers like us to say, uh, this show is meant for educational and entertainment purposes only if, oh, it is not meant for medical advice nor intended to diagnose, treat, prevent, or cure any condition, not even including a wart on your thumb. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns related to your specific conditions, please contact a qualified healthcare professional. Uh, everyone, help me welcome Amber. Give me some clappy hands and the or thumbs up in in the comments, we've got people live, but we can't see who they are. Give us a comment. Let us know you're here, where you're joining us from. And um, all right, Amber, I'm, I'm going to talk a lot at the beginning, and then you get to talk a bunch after that. So <laughs> uh, I met Bye. Amber at a health conference, one of the health conferences. We met up at several of them, but I don't remember if we met originally at a Low Carb USA conference or Ancestral Health Symposium or somewhere else. But immediately, I was so impressed with her. She's so intelligent. And her depth of analysis. Um, wash hands. Okay. Oh, this is this is my support person. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, wash hands. Are we trying to wash our hands of this subject already? No, we're <laughs> we're just getting started. Um, Alan. Hey, Amber. Keto and sleep doc here. Awesome. Hey, Alan. Yeah. Glad you're here. Um, yeah. So I met I met Amber and probably heard her talk and was so impressed um and just the depth of analysis and re research that she does in her talks and also she's talking about things that nobody else is talking about and and just something about the way that she thinks about things she's always looking for different angles and i just so many of her talks have always been like oh my gosh that's really cool i quote them all the time um but her official bio is uh she has an e eclectic background with academic publications in several fields including theoretical mathematics cognitive psychology, computational linguistics, and more recently, evolutionary nutrition and biology. She has been studying and experimenting with low-carb ketogenic diets since 1997 and is particularly interested in evolutionary constraints and interspecies differences. Amber has been eating a nearly plant-free diet since 2009. So there we go. Welcome, welcome, Amber, to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. <laughs> Virt virtually yes virtually great before we started the live button here we were trying to figure out the last time we saw each other it was probably like um march of 2018 i think in uh bozeman montana at an ancestral health, health symposium i think that, that was our best guess incredibly too long ago <laughs> too long <laughs> too long <laughs> Yeah. 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 Well, just for our viewers that don't know who you are, would you mind just kind of starting out with um, how your diet has evolved over the years um, and how it's impacted your health? So way, going back to 1997 or even before, wherever you want to start. Sure. Yeah. I, I did start a low carb diet in 1997. Before that, you know, I was brought up vegetarian. I was born in 73. So basically I've been on a low carb diet of one form or another for half my life for like two dozen years. And then the last half of it has been on a carnivore diet in particular. So it's been a very strange evolution. Um, my mother thinks I'm rebelling, I'm sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I was on a vegetarian diet growing up. It wasn't super strict, like we would occasionally have some chicken or fish, um, and I was allowed to have meat if I went out somewhere, but basically our household was largely vegetarian. And and so I grew up with that kind of um, 
nor that was normal to me. And so when I first started having trouble with my weight, which is when I first went to university, I my first thought was, well, I should go back to eating vegetarian like I was brought up to. And I read lots of books at the time that's totally supported that, like they were saying, you know, if you're having health problems or weight problems, you should cut the animal products and cut the fat. And <laughs> so that didn't work for me at all. <laughs> Um, but I tried it for a really long time and I even doubled down and, and became vegan for a while, um, or plant-based, whatever they call it now. Back then they called it vegan. Um, now I think that means something different. <laughs> um, and it was only after that really failed me and um, I had a different experience. I, I went traveling and I, I dropped my vegetarian diet because of convenience and it didn't hurt my weight. In fact, I lost some weight while traveling and that made me think, well, all right, <laughs> obviously this isn't the thing that's preventing me from losing weight. So maybe I should go look into that crazy low carb thing that I heard about one time. And and that's that was the beginning of a really, well, uh, uh, something that's affected me for the rest of my life. Um, and, and I, when I first started a low carb diet, um, if you've heard me speak before, I say this every time, but <laughs> my, the first book that I found was Mike Eads's and Mary Dan Eads's book, Protein Power. And they had a lot of you know, science in it that blew my mind because it was completely opposite to anything I'd ever heard, but they had references. And so I went to the local medical library and looked them up and I was like, wow, this is legit. <laughs> and this sort of started a, a, a lifelong pursuit of looking at nutritional literature, which I, over time, got familiar with the different ways that people argue and, and how things aren't always the way that they seem. A recurring pattern that I see is that the authors will present data and they'll present their interpretation, and I don't always agree with their interpretation of their own data, which is a little bit um, maybe obnoxious of me since I didn't do the experiment, but I get to. <laughs> oh, so you started looking at um, nutrition research back when you had to go through a card catalog to find. Oh yeah, I used microfiche. Things, right? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm very old. Yeah. Um. So, I you you sent me the link to your talk, which which when I asked you what do you want to talk about, because there's so much stuff that you could you could talk about, and uh, you one of the um things I remember most, and I don't remember where this was that you did this talk about how when you looked at research on Inuit populations that how they didn't show ketones in their blood. That's the ones I, one of the ones I talk about frequently to people about how we adapt to that state and you're not going to be able to, which blows my mind that was, because that was back in what, in the 30s or something? And they were actually even able to take blood samples back then. But anyways, there was a ton of topics that Amber could talk about. So I let her pick. <laughs> and um, so there was a talk that you did in, in January in uh, Boca Raton at Low Carb USA. Um, and it's about sleep and keto diet and satiety. And originally I saw that and I was like, these are three random words. How do they fit together? <laughs> um, so I listened to the talk. And so I, I've got some questions, you know, based on that for you to present the information to our uh, to our viewers, our listeners and anyone in the future. And um, Great. so... So I'm wondering just to start too, because a lot of my followers are just going to be lay people. They have no information. So I'm here to make analogies and uh, not not dumb it down, but make it really approachable because, um, you know, some of these terms and things like that, that are a lot of our people is. Well, I lost you. I hope you didn't lose me. Hmm. All right, we're back. My entire okay. internet, my entire <laughs> internet connection just dropped. So luckily, they've got like three options for me here. So okay, we're back, everyone. <laughs> Hopefully, that was not too bad. Okay, just to start with, um, you know, in talking about these three things: keto, sleep, and uh, satiety. But also, I'm bringing in obesity. So all, really, you covered those four, and just to kind of start this whole 
uh, how do these things relate? If if you wouldn't mind kind of sharing about the different sleep stages, um, you know, slow slow wave and REM and anything else that you want to throw in there for people. Yeah, so there are, there are a lot of different ways that we could talk about what sleep is, and um, sleep stages are something that happen. You know, it's, some, it's something that you can't see, right? So you go to sleep and it just all basically looks the same. The person is inert. <laughs> and um, but there's but there's more going on if you if you measure actual brain waves. And it turns out that there are patterns um, happening and that we can identify and the patterns um, they alternate. So the main two uh, stages that we identify would be REM sleep, which stands for rapid eye movement, because during that stage of sleep, there's a characteristic kind of back and forth um, eye movement that's happening. Um, and REM is, is actually physiologically a lot like being awake. So your mind is very active, your brain, your brain is very active in a way that is um, sort of paradoxical and sometimes it's actually called paradoxical sleep in the older literature although um, REM is the more modern term and um, then the other main kind of sleep stage is slow wave sleep and what's happening during slow wave sleep is really kind of amazing all your all your neurons turn off at the same time it's called coordinated neuronal silencing and um, actually even when you're awake, it turns out that there's actually a very small percentage of neurons that are firing at the same time, something like 3% or it's definitely less than 10%. It's very surprising um, that, but what's happening while you're in slow wave sleep is that they're all going off at the same time uh, in, in this um, pulsing thing that creates this delta wave that shows up on your, your, your elect electrodes. Um, so, Slow wave sleep can be, it can be lighter or deeper, and it depends. We just have these arbitrary cutoffs of how big that the wave is. Um, and what happens is the, the stages alternate throughout the night. So, so it's usually, you know, slow wave sleep and REM and slow wave sleep and REM with, with little, there might be wakings in between um, that are very brief. You might, you're probably not even aware of them. Um, but one thing that happens is that the slow wave sleep is takes up more proportion of the time during the first half of the night, and REM takes up more proportion of the time during the second half of the night. And they have different functions. Um, we're not necessarily clear on what the functions of the different parts of sleep or what sleep does at all. There, there are lots of good theories, and I'm not saying that we don't know anything or have good ideas about it, but it's really a developing field and it's been a mystery for a really long time. Um, so, you know, an analogy I made in the talk was if we talk about food and how we need food, we we kind of know what we need food for. We have a pretty good idea about how the, the different nutrients are used as enzymes or used as building blocks or used as energy. Um, so we don't we don't have have to guess as much. Whereas when you talk about sleep, we don't. We can talk about these things that sleep does, but most of what we know about that comes from depriving animals of sleep and seeing what what breaks. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And we can correlate that to the different stages too. So that's that's your basic rundown of sleep stages. Oh, it's, it was so fascinating when you said that in your talk about how there, there's mostly we don't know what sleep even does. It's just kind of mind-boggling to think about the fact that like we don't know <laughs> we know we need it and a lot of people you know all animals all animals need it right um well i don't know we're getting off topic there but um so yeah. one of the next points you had too was um uh there's a lot of scientific articles on the web on ketogenic diets that um and sleep <laughs> that uh let's see the sleep stages draw mistaken conclusions so uh, what really happens to deep or slow wave slow, slow, blah, blah, blah. I can't even like slow wave sleep and REM on a keto diet. So what's the truth basically? There's myths out there. <laughs> so if you want to tell us like what is what are the articles saying and then what the what the truth is? Yeah, well, it's really interesting whenever somebody who doesn't really have a a, a very 
big background in ketogenic diets, tries to write an article about what a ketogenic diet might do related to something that they do have expertise on. There are a couple of pitfalls that they might make. And one of them is um, to talk about what is what happens if you have high fat, right? And there may be some things that where that makes sense to look at. We all know that a high fat diet that's a high carb diet has a completely different effect on metabolism than, than a high fat diet in the context of very, very low carb, right? So um, w some people will look at um, say, what's the effect of having high fat on sleep stages or sleep duration or sleep quality in, in some way. And um, it may actually have no correspondence to what happens in the ketogenic conditions. So we can, we can dismiss those right away. Another problem that often comes up with, go ahead. I was going to say to, to clarify that's often the phrase high fat diet is used in nutrition research, but it really is referring to also what we call like the standard American diet, high fat, high carb, but they'll just see high fat. And so then like you're explaining, people will mistakenly apply that article to then a keto high fat diet. So in research, they're going to specify either a ketogenic diet or a low carb, high fat or a carb restricted diet, they're gonna specifically mention the carb part of that. So uh, the, I, I was looking through that and a lot of different stuff as well, where they were saying things about gut health. Well, a high fat diet is shown to do this, but you have to go in and look at that. So anyway, so the, the clarity is on when it's called a high fat diet, that generally equates to high fat, high carb, not a high fat, low carb diet, yes. Right, right, and it's a completely different metabolic state. And, and then a second kind of pitfall that can happen when people are looking at ketogenic diets is to not take the adaptation phase into mm. account. So mm. it takes three or four days sometimes, uh, depending on what exactly you do, to switch your m metabolism to a ketogenic metabolism. So, you know, not for sleep. I haven't really seen this so much for sleep, but I've seen things um, on cognition and other things where, you know, they... they Put someone on a ketogenic diet and, and at, at day two they say oh look their brain isn't working as well and it's like yeah well <laughs> they haven't keto adapted and they're not getting enough glucose so this is kind of a bad time to be measuring but um, a third way is um, a lot of the studies that are done on ketogenic diets are are specifically looking at people who have some kind of medical problem like obesity or like epilepsy in particular or some other Thing that requires intervention, and so if you just look at um, what people, what happens to people when they go on a ketogenic diet, in the context of having some metabolic or some uh, medical issue, it might not give the same um, result as if you just put a, a basically healthy person on a ketogenic diet. Um, so that's something to watch out for, and that is something that I did see in some of the. Um, literature, or at least in some of the um, summaries or reviews that I saw on the web when people are looking at what does a ketogenic diet do to sleep stages in particular. So it happens that um, there are some evidence that in people with epilepsy, and I think there was another case with obesity, where um, REM sleep was increased. And so the conclusion was oh, a ketogenic diet increases REM. But in those particular cases, um, it seemed to me that REM was um, disrupted. And what was happening is that REM was being brought back to a normal level. And the reason that I'm so confident about that is that I looked at other studies where the, the context was fasting. So uh, <laughs> one way of trying to look at what would happen on a ketogenic diet that I think is a bad way is to say, oh, what happens when you look are on a high fat diet that's also high carb? And another way that's not quite looking at a ketogenic diet but, and, and so is not exact either is fasting, but at least fasting does put you in a, a ketogenic state, right? <laughs> so I'm gonna trust uh, something that I read about fasting more than I trust something that's a high carb, high fat diet. Um, and the fasting uh, studies in humans have shown um, an increase in slow wave sleep and a decrease in REM. Um, not a drastic decrease, but like from 25% to say 20% of your night's sleep. 
And um, so I, I'm fairly confident that that's representative of ketogenic diets, whereas the increase in REM that you see in patients in epilepsy who had compromised REM sleep is, is a, more of a normalization effect. Mm. One of the things you mentioned too in your talk was how a lot of people with obesity tend to be also oversleep. Um, yes. Yeah. And so and that that's a really complicated thing. So um, mm -hmm. <laughs> there there is where am I going to start with this? So <laughs> there 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 can be oversleeping in obesity, um, and there can be undersleeping in obesity. <laughs> and in fact, if if you're looking just observationally at people who are at um, different, if you're just comparing uh, weight with sleep duration, you get this U curve. So people who are overweight sleep too much and people who are um, overweight or people <laughs> people who sleep too much are overweight and people who sleep too little are overweight. And the like best weight corresponds to like this, you know, six or seven to eight hours of sleep, which is part of why th that's the recommendation because it's like a um, correlation causation kind of idea. Like, well, this is where the people are the healthiest. So we're going to recommend that you get that amount of sleep. And, you know, there's some, there's some logic to that. It's not completely um, crazy. Um, but I think that the reason that sometimes people oversleep when they're over when they're overweight has to do with um, their, it could have to do with a couple different things. What, one is this kind of phenotype of a very depressed overweight person uh, that sleeps too much. Um, and those, those things often go together. Um, and the other thing is the whole connection between energy and sleep duration, which uh, we'll hopefully get into a lot more. Um, on the other side of it, though, with not sleeping enough, it's more it's more of a mystery because you would think, well, if they're um, if if they're getting so much energy at, that they're gaining weight, then why wouldn't they be sleeping longer? And that puzzle, um, to unravel it, I think we have to talk about the the difference between um, short sleep in an acute sense and short sleep in the sort of chronic long-term sense. So if you, if you just get a short night of sleep, like say you only get five or six hours of sleep, uh, that's going to have effects on like immediate effects on your cognitive ability and on your metabolism. And if you do it for several days in a row, those are going to accumulate and get worse and worse or you know, more acute, let's say, uh, to be less judgmental about it. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I'm fairly comfortable with saying that cognitive deficits are worse. <laughs> but the other thing that happens is that metabolically, your, your fat tissue becomes more insulin resistant. And that is generally medically in the mainstream medical world um, held to be a bad thing. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing because for your fat tissue to be insulin sensitive, that means that it stores fat easily. Um, and so that's not necessarily what you want if you're trying to lose weight. Um, but it's very confusing because insulin resistance is a broad term that is associated with having high levels of insulin and um, your tissue is becoming insulin resistant as a sort of consequence of this chronic uh, situation where you have so much insulin going around that your your tissues just can't take any more. But um, if you're if you just have an acute response of insulin resistance, that doesn't necessarily that doesn't necessarily correspond to um, that diabetic insulin resistant state. But nonetheless, if we have um, we we have this one uh, set of data that's showing us that if you sleep deprive someone in the acute sense, they'll get insulin resistance. And then we also have this long-term observational data that uh, people who have short sleep are also tend to be obese. Then it's, it's kind of tempting to draw this picture to say, well, the, what's happening is that 
as you continue to be chronically sleep deprived, this causes insulin resistance, which then causes obesity. And um, I don't actually think that that's true. Um, and one of the reasons that I don't think it's true is because of what happens to animals when you completely sleep deprive them. Um, so you want to talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm I just had a thought too about that acute uh, insulin resistance that happens at the cellular level. Is that it? It would make sense that short term, that it's going to keep more of that um, glucose in the blood rather than storing it, so that you have energy supply readily available when you haven't had adequate sleep. There's probably something there. I'm thinking that you know, physiologically, your body's doing that. Yeah, and the the interesting thing about that. Um, I don't know if you've been following uh, Peter Dobromilski's work on the proton theory, and um, it's also been talked about by Brad Marshall and by Mike Eads about this idea that, um, how do I make this simple? <laughs> it's kind of complex. Mm -hmm. uh, but satiety is um, related to insulin resistance. So when your fat cells are full, they they stop taking in glucose. They become insulin resistant. And that's a good thing because you don't want them to keep growing. And if your if your cells were more insulin sensitive, then they would just suck up that glucose and then you'd be hungry again because you don't have all this energy in your bloodstream, right? So so a ketogenic diet actually induces insulin resistance in a positive way. It's completely reversible. If you go off, like if you unketo adapt <laughs> for a couple of days by eating high uh, levels of glucose, your insulin sensitivity will um, immediately return. So that's a physiological difference. And this is something that shows up, um, for example, in pregnant women who have to take a glucose tolerance test, or anybody who has to take a glucose tolerance test, uh, you, you might notice if you're on a ketogenic diet, you will fail that glucose tolerance test mm -hmm. because you're in a, a cellularly insulin resistant state. Your cells are, are taking up fat. They're not taking up glucose. They're, they're, um, they're actually kind of glucose intolerant. Um, so what people are advised to do is if they have to take this glucose tolerance test to go off a ketogenic diet for at least three days, eat like 300 grams of carbs a day and get your body back into glucose mode so that you can pass that test um, if that's what you need to do. <laughs> um, but obviously a ketogenic diet isn't causing um, diabetes. Uh, well, some people might have that bizarre idea, but because it's reversible, it's not that's not what's happening. And you're, it's not causing obesity, it's actually causing you to lose weight. So the, the whole insulin resistance piece becomes very um, tricky because it's so contextually dependent. And so when I see, oh, uh, sleep deprivation causes, or sleep restriction causes insulin resistance in the fat tissues, my immediate thought is, well, wait a minute, maybe that's adaptive maybe that's not a bad thing. But if you're on a high carb diet, then maybe you've got two discordant things going on. So another thing that does happen uh, with people, uh, and nobody ever studies ketogenic people generally, so we're just talking about people on regular high carb diets, and you're looking at this these sleep restriction studies, what happens is um, they, they have... Um, more glucose intolerance, you give them a meal and their glucose and their insulin will shoot up way more than um, normal for them. And they will uh, typically eat more and, you know, have metabolism that's leading to weight gain. But my, my immediate question is, well, what, what would happen if you had that same study, but they were on a ketogenic diet so that that, um, insulin resistance is actually concordant with the metabolic state that you're in and it's going in the same direction rather than going in the opposite direction. So if you just gave them very high fat and some protein um, rather than some carbs, would that actually enhance weight loss? I don't know. Um, I, that would be very interesting to look into. Maybe we, we need to have different terms then, right? So the glucose intolerance versus insulin resistant. 
define the with the context of each uh, thing that's going on. Yeah, yeah, I like that suggestion. Maybe, maybe in a thousand years we'll have all this nutrition <laughs> stuff figured out. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Now you had something you wanted to go to next, and now I, I've been so in the moment, I'm like, I forgot what point you wanted to go to next. So do you remember what that was? Oh, yeah. I was going to talk about um, different species given oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. sleep deprivation. Yeah. So yeah, that was fascinating. If, if uh, in, Yeah, go ahead. I'll let you go ahead. <laughs> okay. But stop me at any point. Um, oh. Okay. So, so in humans, we know that if you give them, if you sleep, restrict them, they'll have glucose intolerance, they'll get hungry, they'll actually eat a lot more, and they'll have other markers of, of hunger, and they will gain weight. Um, but if you take other animals, and you completely sleep deprive them, so total sleep deprivation, well, what happens to all of them eventually is that they die. And that's why we don't do that experiment in humans, um, at least not for very long, um, because we don't want to take it to that point. Um, but it's been done a lot in other animals, um, specifically uh, some old, old studies, a lot of studies in rats. And what happens when you completely sleep deprive rats is it takes about two to three weeks for them to die. Um, but what happens to them as like before they die <laughs> is that first of all, their for, their body temperature decreases, and their cells start burning a lot of energy because they they'll start having mitochondrial uncoupling, which is this um, phenomenon where the cell is uh, burning energy without creating ATP. Um, mm. It's just wasting it, basically, and it makes mm. heat. And so it it could be functionally partly that they're trying to make heat to make up for the lowered body temperature, but I'm not actually sure what the lowered body temperature is from. Um, so I don't want to state causality when I'm not sure. Um, but those two things happen. But the they're burning so much energy that they are basically ravenous, and they're eating so much they're eating as much as they possibly can, but they can't keep up with the energy deficit that this is creating. And so they they burn like, but before they get to the point where they die, they're burning like twice as much calories as as normal and, and still dropping weight. You've got so, people right now going, sign me up. I'd love to have that problem. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Well, <laughs> well actually... <laughs> There's this thing called DNP. Uh, it's a, it's a, it was a weight loss drug. It's, it's mm. now um, you can't get it because it kills you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Imagine uh, that. <laughs> and and it works through causing uncoupling. It's mm. and mm. it's um, it's like the Holy Grail. Like you cannot eat enough to make mm. it not work, but the effective dose is too close to the toxic mm. dose right mm. and so people like bodybuilders and people have died you know and i can just imagine like them thinking well i'll just keep it you know right at the level and i'm just going to do just enough and mm -hmm. it's, it's really tragic um yeah but it's the same kind of effect and and people are working now um trying to find a better uncoupler uh, that will do the same thing but not be so dangerous. And I don't mm. know where progress is on that right now, but like any day now, someone might have something like that on the market. I know it's being worked on. Um, or it might be that anything that's effective has that same problem. I don't know. Um, yeah, and I wonder if it's irreversible too. Like if you do it too long, the cell adapt to that state and it might be too late to reverse it. I don't know. It could kill the cell if you push it too far, but I, I don't know. Um, but so, so we've got this contrasting effect, right? We've got these lab animals who you sleep deprive them and it causes weight loss and, you know, ravenous hunger. And in humans, it seems to cause the ravenous hunger, but not the weight loss. So that's kind of a bummer, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, and one wonders if it has to do with just the fact that it's that humans are only getting partial sleep deprivation and maybe you need much more sleep deprivation. Um, but I think um, there there may be there may be possibly a way to get around it. Um, and to talk about that, I want to talk about the uncoupling just a little bit more without getting too technical. There are proteins involved called uncoupling proteins, and they get activated, and they do diff slightly different things. And the th there are three main ones that we study. And the most famous one is called um, uncoupling protein 1, <laughs> UCP1. Um, named because it was the first one, I guess. Uh, but it, it's <laughs> probably not the, it, it seems like evolutionarily it's a more recent one. And it's the one that really drives up uncoupling in brown fat tissue, uh, which brown fat tissue is, is also kind of holy grail. We know that a ketogenic state causes fat tissue to become more brown, but humans don't seem to have as much brown fat as uh, say rats do at all, and some people think that that's completely a species difference, and it may well be. So one hypothesis about why rats would have this weight loss effect and humans don't is that UCP1 is just much lower in humans than in, in rats, and so we may, not have, we may not have as much uncoupling ability. I don't think that that's probably strictly true because, because ketogenic diets and, and other things that we do, like um, cold exposure and stuff, can can ramp up uncoupling proteins in fat and in muscle, and um, and because you know uncoupling works. <laughs> um, mm. so, so can you, Amber? Can you explain a little bit about uh, brown fat and white fat? Yeah, um, it basically it has to do with the density of my, mitochondria in the in the fat tissue, um, and so the more mitochondria there are. The, the more the uncoupling can uh, waste extra energy and create heat. And so with the UCP1, it's thought to be actually that that's the purpose of it is to create heat. So in cold temperatures, that's why cold exposure will upregulate it. Um, mm. So rats, babies have more than adults do. And, and so it's thought to have this um, thermog thermogenic function. Mm. Um, but there are other uncoupling proteins that do um, other things. They uncouple, but to a lesser extent than UCP1. So UCP2 causes glucose intolerance at the level of the cell by preventing pyruvate from getting into the Krebs cycle. Um, so that's interesting because now we have another thing where uncoupling is related to glucose intolerance. And similarly, UCP3 has to has a function related to uh, increasing fat oxidation, and so all of those things are going together to this picture of burning more fat and and generating more heat and wasting more energy, and all of those things seem to be upregulated. Um, well, <laughs> in the in the human case with sleep deprivation, we don't see an upregulation of mitochondrial uncoupling. And so this is part of the mystery. Um, and what I am what I am guessing is that because we're eating high carb diets, and this is a hypothesis of mine and it may turn out to be false. I would really love to see it tested. But I'm guessing that when you have sleep deprivation, but you're coupling it with a high carb diet, which is not really um, very concordant with human uh, evolutionary history. We didn't have a lot of access to uh, carbohydrate and probably in a case where you have sleep deprivation, it might um, be going along with um, food or glucose deprivation as well. Uh, but one could imagine that in the low carb context, maybe sleep deprivation, even partial sleep deprivation, would encourage mitochondrial uncoupling um, more than sleep deprivation plus glucose, which kind of puts the brakes on the mitochondrial uncoupling. So my hypothesis is that the reason that humans are having are, are gaining weight when they have um, 
sleep deprivation that causes glucose intolerance is that they're eating glucose. <laughs> <laughs> and that if you're in a ketogenic state, maybe sleep deprivation would actually enhance weight loss. And I don't know if that's mm. true or not, but um, now everyone's oh going to go try it and tell me, right? <laughs> that's going to be the next uh, weight loss wave. Sleep deprivation. Oh, I'm going to get in so much <laughs> trouble. I'm encouraging people to lose sleep. <laughs> Somebody, somebody's going to write that book right now. <laughs> oh, the the sleepy keto. The yeah, I, I'm so Sleep tired. And, diet. Yeah, <laughs> if, if people didn't feel deprived enough on a keto diet, now they can't even have sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna be lambasted for this one because <laughs> sleep deprivation is not really very good for you, and the reason it's not very good for you, mm. um, well, <laughs> again, we don't really know, but uh, <laughs> one, one theory, um, one theory about what causes a need for sleep has to do with uh, reactive oxygen species, so oxidative stress. Um, oxidative stress builds up in the body in response to making energy. It's, it's a byproduct of making energy. And it turns out that it accumulates over time and sleep uh, lowers it. <laughs> so, so there is, there are some groups of scientists who think that this is the primary or a primary regulator in sleep. Uh, and, and one of the main functions of sleep is just to um, deal with that ongoing oxidative stress. Um, and one really cool study from a couple of years ago that uh, confirms that or supports that theory is they took... Um, I think it was fruit flies. I think they also looked at rats, but I think it was fruit flies that uh, were the ones where they gave some antioxidants to the animals and it cut, it extended their survival time under total sleep deprivation by a factor of two, which is really mm. like huge. Um, so, so that really supports the idea that the need for sleep is being driven at least in part by this buildup of uh, oxidation. Um, so if, if you can address that oxidation, um, if you don't address that oxidation, um, that's one of the things that's going to be a problem with sleep deprivation. So <laughs> sleep deprivation does have um, other benefits, actually, one of the benefits of uh, sleep deprivation is that it is an antidepressant, uh, a very strong antidepressant. Mm. Uh, mm. You take people and who are depressed and give them four hours of sleep a night, and for many of them, it will treat their depression. But it's completely wow. unsustainable, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because one really bad thing that it does is it puts your cognition in the toilet, your mm, reaction time. Mm. You're like a drunk person, basically. Um, it, it's very, very bad. It's the cause of accidents. Um, mm. So so we're in this conundrum where there's, there are some definite benefits to sleep deprivation, some tantalizing potential hypothetical benefits to sleep deprivation, and yet really, really bad problems with sleep deprivation. Mm. And so how do you um, how do you manage that? One thing that um, is really interesting about ketogenic diets is that they increase sleep. I, I mentioned that they increase slow wave sleep, but I, what I think is true is that they they increase the intensity of slow wave sleep. So remember we were talking about how the first half of the night you get more slow wave sleep and the second half of the night you get more REM. Um, that's because your sleep drive is driven, it's driven by this need to get uh, slow wave sleep for whatever reason, for a variety of reasons. Um, it does all kinds of things, all kinds of things happen. Like um, you clear, you get a clearance of metabolites and oxidative, um, metabolites in the brain. Um, it's good for cognition. There's There are correlations between, um, uh, if you have dis a diseases like Alzheimer's or something, there, there's at least a correlation between better sleep and better cognitive, like less cognitive deficit. Um, so anything that increases energy 
in the brain, energy use in the brain during the day will then increase the intensity of slow wave sleep. And so that means the waves, the waves are that we were talking about are, are higher amplitude or there's more of them in a shorter period of time. And so it makes your sleep more efficient. And so one thing that might be happening with a ketogenic diet is that because of that increase in sleep intensity and slow wave sleep, um, you're getting more bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you're getting more of the benefits of slow wave sleep crunched into the same amount of time, or you might even decrease the amount of time needed by a bit. Um, it's kind yeah, of that's definitely what I've noticed for my clients. They, they report that they sleep less hours and they just feel so much more refreshed when they do wake up and more energy. And, and some of them actually are very concerned because they're like, I, they, they think something's wrong because, oh, I just, I can't fall asleep for a couple of hours. And I said, well, how do you feel when you wake up? Like you're, I'm only sleeping six hours a night and they're very worried. I'm like, well, how do you feel when you wake up? Well, I feel great. I'm like, well, you get two more hours in your day now, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> sleep, sleep quality and sleep duration are, are different things. And, mm -hmm. and it, the time, the amount of time you spend in bed uh, doesn't, you can, one person can have seven hours in bed and, and be getting really high quality sleep. And another person could just be uh, having a lot of wakings or, or not getting very deep or um, so yeah, if it, insofar as a ketogenic diet improves sleep quality, which I think it does, um, you're likely to need less. <laughs> um, so another thing that is kind of related to that, that we didn't talk about at all, but I went into, into the talk is these two um, neurotransmitter neuropeptide uh, chemicals and without getting too technical about it there's there's a wakefulness one called orexin and a, a sleepiness one called adenosine and they both go up on a ketogenic diet and which is really fascinating because they have opposite um, effects and so one of the things that I was speculating in in my paper and in my talk is that because they're both going up what happens is that well adenosine the sleepiness one like sleep deprivation, in fact, um, it's it's believed that the reason that uh, sleep deprivation gives these antidepressant effects is because of the increase in adenosine. And, but adenosine makes you sleepy. Um, but it, uh, in a ketogenic diet, it doesn't seem to make you more sleepy. And maybe that's because the orexin is balancing it out. They, um, they mutually inhibit each other. Um, so, I, I tend to think, and of course, I'm a little bit biased toward ketogenic diets because of all the wonderful things that they do, but I, I think that maybe what a ketogenic diet is allowing to happen is that you're getting more of adenosine, the sleepiness, without getting the, the normal sleepiness that no, uh, would accompany it, um, and therefore you're able to get those benefits without the detriments. And insofar mm. as that is true, we may be able to at least slightly um, reduce our sleep deliberately on a ketogenic diet and still maintain benefits, but it's it's a empirical question. Mm. So fascinating. Ah, um, well, let's let's talk about the satiety part then. Uh, how does this all how does this all take tie together with the the satiety? We covered it a little bit where. Um, Sleep de deprivation makes you hungrier. Is that is that the summary? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there's there's a lot. So so satiety should be <laughs> um, directly related to your energy availability, um, mm. which which some people have shown to be tied to metabolic rate. So if you're making a lot of energy, your metabolic rate is high, you're turning a lot of material into energy, and then using it. Um, metabolic rate also seems to be directly uh, tied to po probably, I believe, causally to hunger, which would make sense, right? Because you should be hungry exactly when you feel like you're not getting enough energy. So if your metabolic rate is low, your energy output is low. 
and if your brain senses that somehow, then that should tell you to eat. Whereas if your metabolic rate is high, you're producing all kinds of energy, there should be energy in the blood and um, uh, the metabolic kind of uh, metabolites or, or um, byproducts of making energy should be in the blood, which your brain can pick up on. And then so your body, sh your your organism, yourself should say, okay, I've got lots of energy, I'm not hungry. Um, that would make that would make perfect sense, right? Um, but the the interesting thing is that the high rates of energy use also uh, correlate to sleepiness and sleep duration. So if you have a lot of if <laughs> it's like uh, when you're using a lot of energy in the brain and it causes a, a lot of uh, good intense sleep. Similarly, when you have a lot of energy, um, your sleep duration is more and you, you actually get more REM sleep. Whereas if you are, um, if you're energy deprived, for example, in anorexia, you will often not be able to sleep in the second half of the night, which is when most of your REM is happening. So sleep duration seems to be quite tied to energy availability in a similar way to, um, to the way appetite is. And, and it also ties into uh, the reactive oxygen species, the oxidative stress that we were talking about, because uh, we're already talked about how high levels of ROS are instigating sleep, um, and high levels of ROS are, are also uh, tied into satiety, which is um, part of the the theory that I mentioned from Peter Dobromilski um, about how itself will recognize that it's had enough because reactive reactive oxygen species that are created by generating ATP tell the cell, oh, we've got lots of energy. Now we can become more insulin resistant. Now we can we can demonstrate satiety at the cellular level. And so that's, that's concordant with um, the need for sleep and getting lots of sleep. So, and, and then on the opposite end of that, uh, I mentioned orexin as one of these things that causes wakefulness. It also causes hunger. Um, so like the word anorexia means not hungry. Um, anorexin, uh, is this thing that drives wakefulness and hunger. So uh, we, there are actually a lot of common pathways in both in the, in the periphery and the brain for, for, um, for detecting having, ha having enough energy and for sleeping. And so often I see people who are on a ketogenic diet, um, if they're not getting enough to eat, um, such that, <laughs> well, at the ideal case, right, when you're fasting, say, is that your your cell, your fat cells will give up fat, and you'll just use that for energy. That's that's the like, that's what's supposed to happen when you fast or when when you're on some any kind of a diet is that whatever deficit you deliberately create by not eating, your fat cells will just make up. And if that worked, then we probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, <laughs> for a lot of people, it doesn't work. And even in the ketogenic case, sometimes if you cut calories too much or if you fast, yes, you might be able to get some fat flowing out of your fat cells, but it might still not be enough to mm. make your body feel like it's got enough energy. And that mm. can cause wakefulness. Whereas if you add some fat back through intake, um, it's really not going to disrupt um, the fat coming off your body because if, if you're in this situation where, uh, suppose we just compare fasting um, and you've got a certain amount of fat that's coming off your body at a certain rate, but it's not enough to meet all your energy needs, then adding some fat intake can't possibly like make you not lose weight as fast, right? Because you're already maximally giving as much fat as your body is willing to give. So now add some fat to give your body and your brain energy that it needs, 
and you will feel better and you'll sleep better and you're not losing any less weight because your body wasn't going to give up more anyway, if that makes mm. sense. Oh, it, yeah. It, uh, well, I've seen it just anecdotally where, you know, people that have uh, gastric bypass surgery, right? And they're, they, because of that restriction, they end up eating very little per day, maybe six or 800 calories. And I've seen, though, that the rate of weight loss for them is very similar to what my clients experience when they're eating, you know, whatever they want to eat, which ends up being, you know, somewhere between 1500, 1800 calories a day. And so like the calories in calories out model is like, that doesn't make any sense. It can't be possible. But what you're talking about, um, you know, could be part of the explanation of what's going on there. And the body is, there's way more complicated than a math equation. So Valerie's saying that, uh, anecdotally, I also find it easier to adhere to a ketogenic diet when I've gotten enough sleep. Oh, Ah, yeah. So maybe, um, yeah, so there is this idea uh, that when you're sleep deprived, not only are you hungry, but you can be hungry specifically for carbs because carbs mm -hmm. are a fast energy. Um, my suggestion in that case to try is if, if you end up in a position where you've had less sleep, either deliberately or um, or accidentally, and you're feeling those carb cravings, give yourself more fat and see if mm. that energy will will um, put to rest the cravings because that was what they were for, is for energy, um, and they just appeared to be for glucose. Mm. Especially if you're already keto adapted, your body should be able to easily take that fat and create energy from it. Yeah. Thing. If you're not mm. heated up at all, bets are off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, oh, that's really cool. The other thing I, I thought was really interesting. One of the, um, after your talk questions that was in that recording, um, you were talking about cortisol and how it's called a stress hormone, but, and so it, it gets labeled as the bad hormone that's, that's, <laughs> you know, doing bad stuff during stress, but you talked about how it's actually a really good thing. So can you talk, talk about that? Cause we're always like, Oh, minimize your cortisol. You got to get rid of it. Just like everything else that's good or bad. Um, you know, there's a reason our body's making it obviously. So it's doing something. Yeah. The, well, there's one sense in which it's two sides of the same coin, right? So if you cortisol, is this is called the stress hormone because it's a response it can be a response to stress it actually like but what it actually does in its response the reason it's a response is because it reduces stress so mm -hmm. so um it, cortisol um goes up for example if you look at um animals who are that are studied in in the context of dietary restriction for longevity. So you do this like caloric restriction um, to try to induce longevity in different animals. And some, in some animals it works. Um, so they live longer and they also have mildly elevated cortisol. And if you look at the uh, many different papers uh, where they discuss this, what they say is, oh yeah, well this, this, um, mildly increased cortisol is probably uh, probably part of what's giving them longevity because it's it's a it's an anti-inflammatory it's a it's a it's an anti-stress hormone um, mm. so uh, and then but then <laughs> researchers you turn around and look at the literature on ketogenic diets where they're there, in some cases, in some experiments, a similar thing is shown where there's this mild increase in cortisol and everyone says, oh, that's bad. That shows stress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we don't get to see if the person lived longer like we did because they can't say that in the rats, right? If you can't say, oh, their cortisol went up and they lived longer. So the cortisol had to be bad. No, everything mm -hmm. that happened now, you have to say, well, that might have been good. Or at least mm -hmm. it wasn't so bad that it prevented the good thing. But when you, you know when you're looking at a ketogenic diet and everybody wants to hate on them, they'll just pick on anything. But yet cortisol, cortisol, it it could be in certain situations if you just see it being raised all the time, you could say, well, that indicates that something underlying going on is bad because why would you need so much anti-inflammation all the time? So that's mm. that's kind of 
another way of looking at it in which uh, someone might want to say, yeah, you need to lower your cortisol, not because cortisol itself is bad, but because whatever it is that's causing you to need that cortisol, you need to fix. Um, mm -hmm. And that's maybe a more valid way to think about it. Although I don't think that the, I mean, it depends on the levels that we're talking about. Um, and then cortisol has different, has different effects in different situations. So if you have uh, high insulin and high cortisol, the net effect of both of those is fat gain because of the way that they interact at the cell in terms of fat uptake and fat release. But if you have low insulin and high cortisol, it should result in a fat loss. So it's really highly contextually dependent. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, I'm just like thinking of all the, got to lower your cortisol. So then what, <laughs> what do you think of then herbs that people take? Cortisol's high. What are those doing? Are those just addressing the inflammation? Are they actually just suppressing cortisol? Do you know much about herbs that reduce cortisol? I yeah. don't know. I can yeah. imagine there might be both types. Yeah. 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 Well, what else? And those of you listening, watching, please give us some uh, questions in the comments. We'll hang out and answer some questions if you have any here. Um, was there anything else that you were hoping I would ask about or uh, along these lines that you feel like is important to share? Or? I don't think so. We covered a lot. <laughs> yes. Yes. I know there's a bit of a delay for people. So go ahead and put your questions in the comment box there too. If you have any questions about sleep, uh, about uh, satiety, about obesity and a ketogenic diet. Or anything else really. Yeah, or, or anything. <laughs> Just We'll pick and choose whether we answer it or not. So Right, right. Yeah, it just really has me thinking a lot about the 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 fat intake and how you can leverage that too, because we've gone from, you know, the early days of a ketogenic diet for weight loss specifically was lots and lots of fat. And then we've moved through a period of time of, uh, um, oh no, no protein, don't eat so much fat. And the more fat you eat, the less is going to come off your body. Um, and I have found with my clients that moving toward a more protein, po protein centric approach where they're getting adequate protein, which is a lot more than what, originally mm -hmm. I'd have them doing does seem to facilitate more rapid um, weight loss, even though, you know, higher energy intake too. Um, but I know that the experiments that, uh, I don't know if it's experiment, but the approach that Siobhan has found for herself, a much higher fat intake actually has been a way at releasing more fat. Are, are you, would you like uh, to share a little well, bit about that? Um, yeah, let's talk about that at least briefly. So <laughs> There, there have been some pendulum swings over the course of time that I've been hanging around ketogenic diet forums and stuff with um, high protein versus low protein. And, and there, you know, going too low in protein is going to be detrimental. And a lot of people, especially if they're not on a carnivore diet, where they might eat a whole lot of plants. Um, which aren't a very high source of protein, they could end up having protein that that's actually so low that it's not it's not meeting your needs, and it could be causing. Um, well, it, if your body needs to be in repair and it can't do that, that can actually cause your insulin to go up because insulin is part of the inflammatory and re repair response. So getting too low protein chronically can have can cause all kinds of problems, um, and and then the the <laughs> the consensus on what is enough protein, I think has been too low for a really long time. So there's this like 0.8 gram per kilogram of ideal weight, which I think is way too low. I think people actually need like 1.4 to 1.6, at least um, grams per kilogram of ideal weight of protein. And so if you're, if when you say higher protein, if you're moving from something that's more like 0.8 to something that's more like 1.5, then that could really be like a game changer for someone to to get healthier. And once you get healthier, it's easier to lose weight. Um, and then um, if your if your fat is sort of willing, <laughs> you're you're not too metabolically unhealthy. Your insulin is fairly low. And you don't have 
certain types of, uh, say, tissue damage problems that you might see in, say, lipedema or autoimmune disorders, then there, there is a, there seems to be, a, or, or and you don't have a history of type two diabetes, then there seems to be quite actually a, a large range of protein um, that you can eat and still uh, stay healthy and access your fat and lose weight fairly effectively. And so for a lot of people, as long as they're meeting that minimum, you could go like, you could go up to maybe 150, 200 grams of protein and still lose still lose weight. But then for other people for whom um, the fat is not as accessible for any of a variety of reasons, um, lowering protein so that it's much closer to that adequate level level and not very much higher, and then adding a lot of fat for energy is can actually be a lot more effective. So mm. it kind of depends. Both approaches can work. But I think in both approaches, you have to make sure that you really are getting enough protein, and it's not so low that it's that it's a detriment. Hmm. Oh, fascinating! Oh, so there's not one size fits all way of eating for every <laughs> single person on this planet. <laughs> well, um, if we we're all healthy, it's like that Tolstoy, okay, right, that right. Tolstoy quote: uh, "All, all fam, all happy families are happy in the same way, and all hmm. unhappy families are unhappy in their own individual." <laughs> uh, well, here's a good question, but we are not going to have time to cover this. So we've got uh, Kay uh, Stasiak ask, asking how to heal the gut. And you know what, that's I should have that as a future, um, future topic. And uh, anything you want to say real quick on that, Amber? Um, yeah, I used to think that antibiotics were kind of neutral and not a big deal. And I had um, a bad experience with antibiotics that I think, I believe made me prone to infection and, and gave me a lot of gut trouble. Uh, I'm still in the process of fixing it and I don't know the answer, but um, I don't know. That was kind of a side, side note. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think we've got, Dr. Ellen Schaefer here. So many folks who are overweight will have sleep apnea, which will fragment their sleep, continue, contributing to insulin resistance. Usually my patients see me for sleep. Oh, yeah. It's a big vicious circle because um, you, the the sleep apnea will, will wake you. And then, then you're getting like inherently bad sleep quality because it's disrupting all of the processes and in including the duration and then you've got insulin resistance and if you're not on a ketogenic diet that's going to worsen glucose tolerance and affect your ability to eat food well and then and then that can cause obesity and obesity can contribute to sleep apnea because it can like physically make the passages less free so yeah it's a terrible endemic problem <laughs> yeah there's a question from Jennifer. How important is it to adhere to a sleep schedule? Is it helpful to get my seven to eight hours of sleep at approximately the same time each night? Um, yes. Um, I mean, you will sleep better if you sleep at the same time, especially, I think, waking time more than going to sleep time. And mm. I don't remember why I think that. <laughs> so maybe I'm wrong. I'll have to get back to you. Um, but yeah, if you're if you if you have sleep consistency, that tends to contribute to better sleep quality. Thank you for the question, Jennifer. And then uh, Dr. Schaefer, follow up. Uh, I treat their apnea first, then work on carb restriction, weight loss, diabetes reversal, et cetera. So I think sleep apnea needs to be discussed, even if they aren't particularly symptomatic. So uh, I'm assuming it means treats it with probably a CPAP machine or some kind of airflow. Right. So I think what you're saying, Alan, is that if you have an, uh, if you, the patient presents with uh, diabetes or um, overweight, then even if they don't think that they're having apnea, it should be looked into because you can address that right away and that should start to have a positive feedback loop. Maybe that's what you're saying. And yes is the answer. <laughs> <laughs>
And I know so uh, the history of me getting into a ketogenic diet personally was after a car accident and a uh, undiagnosed traumatic brain injury. And every symptom that I had from that, I developed post-traumatic hypopituitarism, which basically my whole body was just like, ooh, a wreck. And um, everything that was going wrong got fixed by going on a ketogenic diet. All the symptoms went away, except for I ended up having this residual um, central sleep apnea. So I was still experiencing that a couple of years afterwards. And I couldn't find anybody that could explain to me how, you know, what was really going on, why that was happening, except for my brain had been injured. Um, and the the therapy that I finally found that worked for that was, it was really frustrating going through the sleep clinic diagnosis and all that kind of stuff, because they basically, <laughs> I'd already lost 60 pounds at that point, And their answer was, well, you should lose some weight. And I'm like, how much more uh, should I lose? <laughs> and so, so they didn't have, they didn't have any treatment for the central sleep apnea, basically, because this, the CPAP machine wouldn't you know, override that. Right. So central, central so sleep apnea central. Is where, Well, yeah, it's where the brain just <laughs> stops remembering to tell your body to breathe. So it's not obstructive like the sleep right. apnea that Dr. Shaver is talking about. So what I ended up doing that, that seemed to work was doing some uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, treatments. And so I seem to be normal now. So, well, I don't know, quote unquote normal. <laughs> <laughs> I won't grant you that, Carol. <laughs> right. <laughs> She knows me well enough. <laughs> um, so Alan's saying, uh, especially after they have trouble losing weight. And so that's, um, say more, are you getting that? I think it, addressing the sleep apnea and finding if that's an issue first can then help mm -hmm. with the weight loss I'm suspecting, right? All right. Well, great discussion here, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. Give it up for Amber for being here, everyone, too. Thank you so much. Oh, I, thank you so much for having me on. So great. Uh, so much to think about here. And um, so, uh, yeah, so next week, join me next week. I'm going to have uh, Randy Webb here, and we're going to be doing some easy techniques to release stress and trauma from the body. He's my former supervisor during my uh grad school degree in psychology. And we did the episode a few months back, but there were some audio issues. And so we're going to redo that episode. So come back next week. And uh, so today we talked about keto diet, sleep, and satiety and obesity with uh, Amber O'Hearn. Thank you again for being here, everyone. And if you like what you heard today, support the show, leave us some more comments, uh, share this episode with a friend, uh, leave us a review. If you're listening on uh, one of your podcast platforms would appreciate you leaving us a review it really would mean a lot it helps more people find out about the show and we can get more people this information that could also change their health and their life um so everyone thank you again for being here thanks to amber and remember help us grow the show and we'll help you shrink <laughs> bye for now everyone we'll bye. see you next time